Welcome back. About two weeks ago, in fact, 12 days ago, on February 22nd of 2020, um, I looked at the S&P 500 after a couple of really bad days for the market, driven by, of course, the fears, the coronavirus and how it was going to affect the economy and earnings. And at that time, I said I'd be back to this, this assessment because at that time I assessed that the value of the index would be about 3000 and I based it on an assumption that earnings would drop about 5% this year and that only half of that drop would be recouped in the following years. But I did say that it's very early in the game and we're going to see more information come out and the market continue to react. And over the last 12 days, we have learned a few more things about the virus and the market. And what I thought makes sense is to actually go back and revisit my valuation, looking at what the market has done as my basis for, for making that reassessment. So let's start with what we've learned about the virus. Clearly, it's gone global. At this point, it's not even a question of whether it's going to be a, you know, around the world. It's, it's making its way around the world, and it's probably going to be unstoppable before it hits pretty much every country. You know, that's, that's been the pattern with, uh, with pandemics before, and in a sense, this is well on its way to being a pandemic. We're also learning more about the virus itself. I mean, it's surprising how little we know about the virus. So I like this uh, chart that I pulled off the New York Times that shows you what we um, what we know about the virus right now. And it shows you that the virus is uh, it's not as contagious as some other viruses, but it could potentially be more deadly. It's nice for those people who dismiss it as just another flu. It's clearly much more dangerous than a typical flu, both in terms of contagion and in terms of you know the potential lethality of what can happen to people who get it. Incidentally, when I say it's going global, not every country is going to see the same impact. Some countries obviously are going to see a much bigger impact from this. And my guess is you're going to see fatality rates vary across the world. I, as I said, that's all I'm going to say about the virus. I'm sure you can find much more information about it. But I want to talk about what we have seen in markets over the last 12 days since my February 26th update. In fact, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go all the way back to February 14th, which is pretty much when markets peaked in the U.S. And I'm going to start with the U.S. indices, the S&P 500, the NYSC, the NASDAQ, the Russell 2000. And you can see this market's not being picky. Every single index is down. You're not seeing one index down a lot relative to the other. In fact, the best performing index, if you can call it that, is the NASDAQ. It's actually dropped the least. So every index has dropped 11 12% over the course of pretty much a three-week period. That's a pretty steep correction. I think, in fact, the percentage drop obscures how big this decline has been. And the best way to probably see it is in terms of dollar values. What I've looked at in this table is the change in market cap collectively for companies across the world. And it's about 7.4 billion, I'm sorry, 7.4 trillion dollars. Even the, even the word trillion is tough to get off, you know, it's so unusual. 7.4 trillion dollars in market cap has been wiped out in three weeks and a little bit more than half of it has happened in the US. So this actually looks at the at the different regions of the world and I broke them down broadly in, in, in geographic terms and you can see that the damage is widespread. In, ironically, the only market that has actually had a positive three week spread is China. And one reason China has not been affected as badly as the rest of the world is China took its medicine, got beaten up before February 14th. The rest of the world now is joining in. So across the world, you're seeing the damage and you're seeing it show out as a drop of about 8% globally and a drop of $7.4 trillion in value. So I decided to take a closer look at where the breakdown was, was, was by looking at different sectors. So these are the S&P breakdown of sectors. And as you can see, across the sectors, there is damage. The, the, and and the, the most damage has been in energy where oil prices collapsed. And we'll look at the oil price drop and financials. And the least has been in utilities and perhaps consumer staples where you've seen less of a drop in stock prices. Again, not unexpected. I decided to take a deeper dive by breaking sectors down into industries and looking at the best performing and worst performing industries in the U.S. And there's a similar table for a global and the, and the, and the tables look very similar. So there's no surprise here. Worst performing industry groups over the last uh, three weeks 
have been airlines, obviously, hotels and gaming, obviously, oil field because of what seems to be happening to oil prices, broadcasting, and that's a bit of a surprise, and life insurance. Again, all explainable. The, 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 so those are the worst performing industries. The best performing industries have been precious metals pushed up by gold. There's been um, retail, grocery retail, and you can see why. Grocery and tobacco is pretty much non-discretionary. Biotech has done much better than the regular pharma business, but you know, and finally utilities. So this damage has been widespread, but there are variations across across different industry groups. Looking across companies in different size classes, and the reason I'm doing this is the conventional wisdom is small companies are riskier than large companies. So when you have a crisis like this, you should have a flight to safety. So larger companies should do better than smaller companies. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case, at least with this crisis. In, in, it's, it's not like you know the, the, the results are consistent across, but the smallest companies are the ones which have been hurt the least in this crisis. But many of them are really, really small. So maybe it's idiosyncratic because if you look at the median drop in a stock price, and that, that's actually across all stocks within each group, the median small company is down, but the, the, across the entire group, you don't see as much of a percentage change in market cap. So if you look across size classes, the larger companies seem to be affected more than the smaller companies, which goes against our base hypothesis, which is a flight to safety. It should make larger companies better investments. The next question I looked at was momentum and P. And the reason I did this is there are there is a group of people who view this correction as long overdue because stocks were richly priced. And they said, well, if you push up prices a lot, then you should see a drop. And the stocks where you see the biggest drop should therefore be the stocks which have been pushed up the, low, the most. So to try to address this question, I broke down companies by momentum. And the way I measured momentum was how much the stock price in these companies had gone up in the year prior to February 14th. So on February 14th, if I looked at stocks and I classified them from the best performers to the worst performers or using the returns over the previous year, this is the breakdown you'd get. And then I track what happened to these stocks over the last three weeks. And here there is some basis for the argument that the stocks that have gone up the most have been punished the most because if you look at the best performers, they've done much worse than the worst performers. But the but as you look across the classes, you see the pattern is not very consistent. You see the percentage change in in market cap is actually greatest for the fifth for the sixth decile right in the middle. So the only thing you can probably draw from this table is that the worst performers, the stocks that have been hurt the most, punished the most pre-February 14th, have had a relatively easier three weeks, but that's not saying much because they tend to be smaller companies. But you no, know, so there is at least partial support for this notion that momentum is reversed. So I then looked at P-E ratios because this is another part of the story, right? If you believe that stocks are being that stocks have been pushed up too much and that this is a correction of a bubble, then the stocks with the highest P-E ratio should be the ones that see the most damage from the correction than the stocks with the lowest P-E ratios. And if you look across the groups, you can see that that is not necessarily true. You see the damage kind of, you know, there is no relationship at least between P-E ratios and damage. It's not like the highest P-E stocks have done worse than the lowest P-E stocks. So there's kind of mixed evidence to back up or rebut people who say this is a vastly overdue correction. Now, if you focus just on equities, you might be missing the rest of the story because there is a rest of the story and interesting things have been happening in other markets. The most interesting, in my view, is the treasury market. We've seen the bottom drop part of rates. You've seen treasuries across the board, three month, two year, 10 year, 30 year drop fairly dramatically. The 10 year dropped below 1% about a week ago for the first time in history, and it's kept going. It's now down to 0.74%, a historic low. US T bond rates are now starting to look a lot more like euro bond rates and Japanese bond rates, where the rates have hit zero and kept going. And this is not a good signal about the future because you know you could talk about the Fed and how it affects rates, but the reality is 
One of the best indicators uh, of future economic growth is what rates are today. And the fact that rates have collapsed means that investors collectively, at least in the bond market, have become a lot more pessimistic about future growth. And again, the coronavirus is the is the obvious, you know, the, the obvious trigger to this reassessment. But that's something to keep in mind. Now, it's also worth looking at, um, at what happened to gold during this crisis, because as with every crisis, gold becomes a place you go to when you don't trust financial markets. And not surprisingly, over this, uh, over this three-week period, you've seen gold prices increase by about 7%. Now, I've always, uh, you know, with Bitcoin, I've, I've been kind of, you know, this on the middle of the, the middle of the road in terms of what I thought about it. But I said, no, you can think of it as a currency, but I've always argued it's not been a very good currency. But there are others who push back saying, well, it's really not a currency. It's like gold. It's let's call it millennial gold. So if it's millennial gold, it's really not behaving like gold, at least during this crisis. I know it's one crisis and one test, but it's a pretty big test. And it's failed the test. It's not behaving like gold or a gold-like asset should. Something to keep in mind if you've been holding on to Bitcoin because you think it's going to be where people run when there's a crisis. It's behaving more like a speculative stock. And finally, what's happening to oil and gas, I think, embodies what's happening on the commodity front. Oil prices are down almost 20% in the last three weeks. I mean, they hit almost, they're, they're hitting lo, levels we haven't seen in this century. Gas prices are down much less. And here again, there is a signal about the future and about how the global economy has become increasingly dependent on China, especially when it comes to the commodity segment of the market. Oil, I think, reflects the fear that the Chinese growth is not just temporarily low, but it could be low for a longer period. But if you add to that a global slowdown, you see why oil prices are down. So I think what you're seeing in the rest of the markets is at least a worry about future, long-term future growth, not just growth this year. So let me revisit how I thought about how the virus is going to play out in value. I said, ultimately, how the virus will play out in value will show up in answers to four questions. First is, how will earnings be affected in 2020? And how much will earnings drop? Because at this stage, it's not a question of whether, it's a question of how much. The second question is, how much of the earnings drop will be recouped in the following four years? Because if this is just a delay in business, it's going to come back. If it's something that's not going to come back, it's going to be a permanent drop. So that's the second question. The third question is what will happen to the risk-free rate because that in a sense signals future growth. And finally, as people get worried and fear starts to mount, how will equity risk premiums change? So let's. I, I looked at what whether there was new information that came out in the last 12 days and at this front unfortunately things are slow moving. For instance, people don't update earnings for the S&P 500 every minute of every day. So the, the updates are coming in slowly. But it's interesting because even on that front, you're seeing how quickly reassessments are being made. So this is actually a, a measure of consensus estimates for earnings in 2020, 2021 from Zacks. And if you look two weeks ago, the estimate for next year was 172. Last week, it dropped to 163 and it's down. So it's down about 5%. So at least based on what analysts are reassessing right now, they're expecting flat earnings. I think there's more damage to be done, that this is a slow moving train when it comes to expectations, that you're going to see ex expectations continue to drop. Incidentally, I had estimated a 5% drop. Maybe I'm being way too conservative. So it'll be interesting to watch how these estimates drop as you go through time. So I did a revaluation re of the S&P 500, leaving the earnings drop at 5% because right now I think we're still early in the game, adjusting the payout down to 85% from 92% saying, you know, companies are more, you know, less confident about the future and pushing up the equity risk premium to 5.69%, which is what my implied premium for the S&P 500 was at the start of March of 2020. And then I computed what would happen to the S&P 500 as a function of two assumptions. One is how much will earnings drop in 2020? That's in the on the left side of the axis, 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%. 20%. And just to give you some perspective, the 2008 crisis cost a 40% drop in earnings. And how much of the earnings will be recouped by 2025? What do I mean by that? If 100% is recouped, you're going to see earnings in 2025 match up to what they would have been you know, without the crisis built in. You're just going to see fast growth 
to make up for 2021. If it's 0%, the drop in 2021 is going to be kind of a permanent effect that's going to keep earnings lower for the next four years. And you can see that the big assumption here is not so much how much will earnings drop, but how much will they come back. If you assume that they will entirely come back, the value of the index actually remains pretty stable no matter what the earnings drop is. One bad year of earnings is not a big deal. But if that one bad year spills over into multiple years, which is what you're seeing with the 75 percent, 50 and 25 and the zero percent, you're going to see much more pain to come. So, as I said, my job is to not to talk you into buying stocks or talk you into selling stocks. That's your judgment to make. You know, it's if you look at this table, you have to make your own assessments on how bad you think the virus is going to affect earnings this year and also how quickly earnings will come back and based on that assessment you can see that you can end up finding stocks to be significantly overvalued still more more pain to come or maybe decide that this is the time you're going to take a stand and actually either buy more stocks or hold on to the stocks you already have and as I you know this is going to continue to be a work in progress because in the next few weeks we're going to see more numbers come in that are going to allow us to get better at estimating what what the effects are going to be and I you know as I look at these numbers I'll tell you what I think will be good for value and good for stocks I think T-bond rates um, you know continue to drop that's not good news in fact those people who think that the Fed is going to come to the rescue and lower rates can bail them out that's not going to be the case I think lower rates here are a bad sign because they're a signal of future growth so to me a good sign in the T-bond rate is to see it rise back about one you know one percent this month this this week and hopefully beyond one percent on the you know volatility on the equity risk premium I think one thing you can look at is the VIX the volatility index and if it's if it goes it, it hit a high of 41 on Friday as the market was pummeled and you were coming off two weeks of complete volatility it was 13 just a couple of weeks ago if it starts to decline that's good for stocks because it's a signal that he, uh, that risk premiums are starting to scale back if it continues to stay high or even gets higher then i think it's a bad sign with higher equity risk premiums lower value I will, you know, the, on the company front, you're going to see more companies come out with earnings guidance. If they if they maintain their guidance and don't cut earnings for this year too much, then that's a good sign. If they withdraw guidance and they start to cut their revenue and earnings numbers for this year, then I think we need to reassess whether the 5% adjustment or the 10% adjustment or a 15% adjustment is better. On the cash flow front, good a good signal will be if continue, companies maintain dividends, perhaps increase them at the, at, the, at the rate they have historically and stay with their planned buybacks. And a bad sign will be if you see dividend cuts and a scaling back of buybacks, both of which you saw in the last quarter of 2008 when you saw that crisis hit. We haven't seen that show up yet with this crisis. Maybe it's early. And if you start to see more of that, then I don't think it's a good sign. So I hope you found the session useful. But you know, as you look at how the virus plays out in markets, it's worth keeping perspective that there's a human toll out there from this virus. In fact, if you gave me a chance to, to do a trade of a large market correction for a small loss of life and a, uh, lives and a quick passing of the virus, I'll take the latter over the former every single time. It's just money. You can always make money back. You can't get a life back. And at times like this, you're reminded that life is fragile of the things that matter most, which is good health and your family. And, and I hope you keep that in mind as you look at your portfolio because i think that you no know, keeping perspective is a big part of getting through these crises so stay healthy godspeed and you know, for god's sakes wash your hands because it's been, it seems to be the very best thing you can do is constantly wash your hands so uh, take care and i'm glad you joined me for this session and i hope you found it useful